the dog breath variations and things like that. You had your doo-wop songs like The Air, Electric Aunt Jemima, and Cruising for Burgers. Everything you wanted from the mothers you had in there. that Uncle Meat ends with the most avant-garde section, just like his previous records, Freak Out and We're Only In It For The Money had. But I think maybe by this point, the fans were more accepting of this because both they had more time to get used to Frank Zappa's music in general, but also with Uncle Meat, what had preceded it on that specific record was a lot less pop than even We're Only In It For The Money or Freak Out. So it was kind of like by the time you get to King Kong, it's kind of like, well, it's maybe a little different from what happened before, but it's kind of, you know, more of a continuum. The politics may not be so explicit, but it's almost more powerful for becoming part of the formal structure of the music and the album itself. The cover shows a um, skull merged with photographs of a face, and there are fingers pulling aside the lips, and you can see gold teeth. and. There is tape which came out on a much later series called You Can't Do That On Stage Anymore, which has Lau George playing a German customs officer interrogating the mothers of invention. And one of the things he interrogates them about is the state of their teeth. And I'm absolutely certain this is a reference to the famous piles of uh, gold extracted by the Gestapo from uh, Jewish victims before they were burned uh, at Auschwitz and in other concentration camps. And so this sinister view of what the establishment will do if there's a social or economic crisis, this reminder of atrocities of the past which could be repeated, hovers over the record. It's, it's still there. On its release in June 1969, Uncle Meat marked the mother's fifth LP in three years and was also their second double album. Continuing the theme of having no commercial potential, Uncle Meat failed to ignite the charts but has since become critically acclaimed. Despite the band's constant stream of musical activity, Zappa had also found the time to facilitate a distancing from record company control. In 1967, Zappa and manager Herb Cohen seized upon an opportunity to create their own production company, Bizarre Records. Spurred on by wanting more creative control over his music and less interference from record executives, Bizarre Productions became a label in its own right with sister label Straight in 1969. It would not only become a platform from which Zappa could operate, but also allowed him the opportunity to release the works of artists perhaps not suited to the mainstream music industry. 1969, Zappa was in a powerful position with his profile in the media, with his gigs, with record sales, everything was going very well. So what he wanted to do was to um, expand his freak aesthetic and get lots more people on board. And so he formed two labels, Bizarre and Straight, and issued um, a whole slew of records which expressed his particular uh, view of what the recording medium could do. And he wanted to get out of the idea that all we do is reproduce pop songs. There's a lot more to what recordings can do than that. So, for example, he produced a double album of Lenny Bruce, the stand-up comedian who'd been who was persecuted by the authorities for his explicitness about sex and politics and race. There was a bunch of uh, self-styled groupies who hung around Zappa, girls together outrageously, the GTOs, and he documented them and their songs and had heavy guests like Rod Stewart and Jeff Beck and Lau George came in to help them write their songs and play. He got to put out some projects that certainly would have never come out on other labels like the GTOs 
and Wild Man Fisher, I don't think those are really good records. They're fitfully amusing, at least the GTOs is. I think Wild Man Fisher is just horrible. Wild Man Fisher, first of all, was a street person who would, for a dollar or for a dime, I guess he would sing songs for a dime. If you gave him a dime or a dollar or something, he would come up with his own weird compositions. Again, he was so off the wall, Frank found this very amusing. And also, it gave an idea of what was going on in L.A. at the time. I mean, you had just weird people on the street singing, you know, and a lot of the freak, the freak scene in L.A. at this time was just huge, okay? Frank was happy that Wild Man Fisher invented himself. He edited Wild Man Fisher here and there, but he let him run amok. He was giving one of the slime balls a chance for immortality, so perhaps he was nicer to Wild Man Fisher than he was to any of us. The main act that he signed that really was the only act that took off and became very successful in the United States was the Alice Cooper group. And the Alice Cooper group at the time were called the Naz, and they had just had changed their name to Alice Cooper due to the fact that Todd Rungren's Naz were erupting and just had a couple albums out in New York. So it was time Alice Cooper group didn't have a record out at this point, had to change their name. And it is interesting that Alice Cooper got the deal because Frank came to see them at a club called The Cheetah. And within about 10 minutes of them starting their set, they'd emptied the place. You know, and Frank thought, you know, that, that a group with so much negative energy, there might be something there. Frank Zappa deserves a lot of credit for starting Alice Cooper's career as a recording artist, but the records that he put out on Bizarre Straight with Alice Cooper, first of all, they weren't as commercial as Alice Cooper's later records, but also Alice Cooper really needed a different business mechanism than Frank Zappa or Bizarre Straight to become as popular as they did. I don't think that Bizarre Strait had the business muscle, really, or the conventional ways of doing things to get Alice Cooper where they eventually got to, which was a very big band, much bigger in terms of record sales than the mothers ever were. Zappa also signed old high school friend Captain Beefheart and subsequently went on to produce the groundbreaking Trout Mask Replica, released in 1969. Trout Mask Replica is Captain Beefheart's definitive record probably the most avant-garde record in the world, definitely at that point, way more avant-garde than anything Frank had done at that point as well. I think Frank was quite willing to sort of record Captain Beefheart in the way that, you know, Captain Beefheart himself dictated. I mean, the original idea was to do it almost like a field recording in the house where they rehearsed, where Captain Beefheart and his magic band rehearsed. But in the end, I think Beefheart wanted, you know, to do it in a proper studio. And um, when that happened, I mean, Frank Zappa had to put up with various idiosyncrasies, like Beefheart not wearing cans to record and just singing a cappella, accompanied by the faint, faint leakage through the glass from the console, which is why a lot of the timing on Trout Mask Re Re Replica seems so peculiar. Frank was quite willing to do this because he recognised from his own struggles, you know, the, the need for artistic control. The black paper between a mirror breaks my heart The moon frayed through dark velvet lightly apart Steal softly through sunshine, steal softly through snow. Pretty much all the songs on Trout Mask Replica would be, had been rehearsed to death. So when they came into 
Whitney Studios, which I believe is the, uh, the uh, studio they started recording all these, the Alice Cooper band, some of Zappa stuff, I think Hot Rats was recorded there. Trout Mask Replica, half of the Trout Mask Replica record. So the songs had been already rehearsed. So the band set up and went through the entire, all the songs, right one after another, note for note. Frank got it on tape. Then he said, let's go do them again just so we make sure we have, you know, I have